How does the brain control movement? Where in the brain is movement? Are there more regions than just one? What neurotransmitters are involved? There's difference in the peripheral nervous system versus the central nervous system. Of course, we have a little section on the disorders of movement conditions. We read up on the different types of muscles, smooth versus striated muscles. I'm going to focus in on skeletal muscles because that is kind of the crux of the chapter here. A muscle fiber is also known as a muscle cell. They have an interior and an exterior. We're looking at someone's bicep. You guys can see there's a bundle of fibers. If we just pull out one cell, that's called a muscle fiber or muscle cell. So this is what we're talking about. So it's got an exterior and it's got an interior. When we talk about the long strands, these are called myofibrils. So myofibril is a long strand of protein that makes up the interior of the muscle cell. It turns out there's a thick and a thin protein that actually make up this myofibril. And the thick protein is called myosin, the thin protein is called actin. These two proteins, when they interact, causes a muscle contraction. If we want movement, our muscles have to contract. Some of them have to contract while the other ones have to relax. Interfere with mobility or movement. Too much contraction will tear muscles, too much stretching will tear muscle. Continuous feedback loop that goes on. When a muscle is at rest, when it's not contracting, there needs to be some kind of a barrier between actin and myosin. And that barrier, we called troponin, covers actin, and it acts as a membrane, a barrier between myosin and actin. So at rest, when the muscle is not contracting, the reason it's not contracting is because troponin's doing its job. Troponin is preventing the two proteins from interacting. Action potential and the calcium that comes with it neutralizes the troponin. So then it can't be a membrane anymore. All right, but let's talk about the exterior. Covered by a membrane. The membrane contains receptors. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter found at the neuromuscular junction. It is essential for the muscle contraction. And by the way, guys, in your textbook, there's a section on how exercise affects muscle <coughs> contraction, how our age impacts our muscles, the difference in the musculature versus, you know, that's all for you guys. <clears throat> the two major types of muscle fibers, we have fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. Again, that's for you guys to do. Because it's really important <clears throat> for contraction to happen, but not too much contraction, and because it's really important for a muscle to stretch, but not too much, one feedback system monitors how much contraction is going on, and we have another feedback system that monitors how much stretching is going on. So the contraction occurs. What is controlling the amount of that contraction? Golgi tendon organs that becomes activated when contractions occur. That information is picked up by something called an IV or an I beta fiber. Sends that information to the spinal interneurons, will eventually help to inhibit stop the alpha motor neurons and their contraction will be stopped. The thing with muscles and movement is there's so many systems that are monitoring so it, it can be a little bit tricky just to pick one system out because there's all these other parts of the brain that are participating that helps us to prevent damage to the muscles. Too much contraction causes damage, we don't want damage, so this is the feedback system that helps to control how much contraction is going on. This is just in general, an alpha motor neuron is a large myelinated neuron directly responsible for contracting muscles. Read up on what a motor unit is. Is an alpha motor neuron and all of the muscles or muscle fibers, it innervates. This grouping would be called a motor unit. All right, so now you know what an alpha motor neuron is. You also know what a motor unit is. You also know the major um, components involved in the contraction of muscle. Sometimes contraction is instead referred to as force, the force of the muscle, how strong the contraction is. There's other things that control stretch and force. This is just the specific feedback loops for that. So. When we are stretching our muscles, the muscle spindles stretch in response to that. We have what we call IA fibers that pick up on the stretching. The IA fibers activate the alpha motor neurons, 
and the spinal cord. And that information that's picked up by the spinal cord gets processed, and then eventually it will prevent further stretching of the muscle. So the key part here would be the muscle spindles and the IA fibers. The way it's written in your textbook is far more complicated than that, which is why I'm stumbling over my words a little bit. So again, I want to make sure you get the, the right information, but not super detailed where we lose the whole point. Sometimes we get so far in the details, you just be like, what are we even talking about? What controls the force of our movements? These help to monitor and make sure not too much force is going on, but would you agree that there are times when you really need far more force? There's two things. Number one, and these are not in any particular order, has to do with what we call recruitment. So recruitment has to do with how many motor units are engaged. So getting more and more muscle units produces more force. The other mechanism that controls the force of our movements has to do with the rate of motor neuron fire. One action potential after another, after another, after another, right on that same site. Muscle. Muscle contraction. Here's another one right behind it. Here's another one right behind it. That's going to contract, 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 contract. Gives you more force. So that's to, to the extent that we're physically capable, engage in far more force. Parts of the brain that you probably already know are involved in movement. Without looking, you should know from chapter two what parts of the brain are involved in movement. Cerebellum, for sure. Primary motor cortex. Basal ganglia. Okay, so those are the three that you should cerebral cortex that are involved in movement. Not necessarily the actual contraction of muscles, but indirectly, so we'll talk about those. There are two spinal motor pathways that are activated, which are involved in movement. One of them is specifically for voluntary movements. This is what we call the lateral pathway. It originates in the cerebral cortex, and it controls called fine voluntary movements. Specifically, the ones that pertain to our hands, our feet, and our outer limbs. Motor motor cortex, okay? So if you look at this, um, it's basically showing you, and I don't necessarily need you guys to know, like, the red nucleus is involved and the pyramids of the medulla involved and all of this kind of stuff. What I want you to know is this is kind of originating t towards the sides. Lateral means towards the sides. This pathway basically communicates spinal cord and the primary motor cortex and other parts of the cerebral cortex. The pathway itself tends to be towards the side of the spinal cord, the lateral pathway. All right, the other one is called the ventromedial pathway, and this is for our more reflexive movements. So I'm gonna call this involuntary. Um, whenever we think of something that's reflexive, we don't necessarily think cerebral cortex, we think more of like the brainstem. Right. So when we talk about the ventromedial pathway that originates here, this pathway, the movement originates in the brainstem, more reflexive movements uh, that pertain kind of to your torso. If you were about to lose your balance, your body, this ventromedial pathway, will immediately activate itself. And it will send messages for, from your brainstem to certain parts of your spinal cord to adjust your torso and adjust more of your larger muscles to prevent you from falling. The lateral pathways for voluntary movement originates in the cerebral cortex. Your ventromedial pathways for involuntary or reflexive movements originates in the brainstem. In the spinal cord, this is where they get their name. Medial means towards the middle. Lateral means toward the side. All right, so what are some of the other things that are involved in movement? So the cerebellum plays an important role in the sequencing of movements, meaning which muscles to contract, which ones to relax. Your cerebellum is coordinating and putting in order all the movements that allow you to engage in the behavior of writing. The first part of our brain that is impacted by alcohol is the cerebellum. So I'm not going to say too much about the cerebellum. We've already talked about the cerebellum. Just know that it's important in the sequencing of movement. So if your cerebellum is impaired at all, either through damage or through some kind of a substance, it is not going to be able to put all that in order. There's multiple steps that have to be in the right order for something like walking to occur. The basal ganglia is another system that is largely involved in movement. 
the basal ganglia is underneath that. So we call it a subcortical structure. Four major areas, the four major structures of the caudate nucleus based on your textbook. The caudate nucleus, that includes the tail of the caudate nucleus, so you've got two of them, actually. Okay? The putamen is this large area right here. You've got two of them. We are not including the substantia nigra. Sometimes it's included, sometimes not. Inside of the putamen, it's called the globus pallidus. And then the fourth structure, the subthalamic nucleus. Why are we talking about the basal ganglia? Because they're actually really involved in some of the neurodegenerative disorders of movement that we're going to talk about after break. Um, what we know about the basal ganglia, collectively, is that it's really important for the choice and initiation of movement. Not necessarily the movement itself. It is the choice and the initiation of movement. Prior to movement actually happening, process needs to be initiated. This is where your basal ganglia comes in. If your basal ganglia or parts of it are damaged, then there's nothing that's initiating these muscles to contract and move. Interestingly enough, abnormalities in the basal ganglia have been associated with obsessive compulsive disorder. Abnormalities have also been associated with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So you know that the motor cortex, or the primary motor cortex, is located in the frontal lobe. This section here is called the prefrontal cortex. The dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is only part of the prefrontal cortex. This is why it's important. When we talk about how the motor cortex and, and various parts of the cerebral cortex are involved, it appears that voluntary movement needs all of these sections of the brain. So I'm going to put these in order. You ready? So this is specifically for voluntary movement. So this pertains to the motor cortex. We have to think about moving. If it's voluntary movement, before movement actually happens, we're thinking about it. We're making this decision to move. Comes from both our prefrontal cortex and our parietal lobe. What does our parietal lobe do for us? What's it from? What does it process? Visual spatials. If I have this goal to move back there and to pick up those outlines, I have to decide to make this movement. I also have to make sure I know where objects are in space so I can find a safe pathway for, for me to move. That's the parietal lobe helping me out. Step one is the decision to move. Step two is the planning of the movement. An area called the supplementary motor area. That is for the planning of the movement, the pre-supplementary motor area. Your supplementary motor area and your pre-supplementary motor area. Then step three, that plan is sent to your primary motor cortex, which then step four activates your lateral pathway, which then activates your spinal motor neurons, which ultimately, last step, initiates muscle contraction. So the decision to move, step two, is the planning of the movement. You've got two sources of input for that. Step three is your primary motor cortex gets that information. Step four is then activates the lateral pathway, activates your spinal motor neurons, which ultimately results in contraction of the muscles.